Yes. All right. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, folks, about that delay. Uh, it was not planned, but uh, I'm happy that we made it through. Uh, so, for the next uh, 35 or so minutes, I want to talk a little bit about lightweight open source. And so, first of all, why? Why are you interested in lightweight open source? So if you're listening to this, if you're out there in the audience or listening to the playback on YouTube, you probably have some interest in giving back to the open source community. Otherwise, you wouldn't be you know, here at ApacheCon with us. Uh, so hopefully that's already you. And the truth is that we already use open source so increasingly in our daily lives. We have our cellular devices are based on open source. Uh, our browsers are based on open source. Major components of most operating systems are built on open source. Heck, operating systems themselves are based on open source. And so are many of the biggest technologies that power the internet as we know it. So why, what's in it for me? Well, the truth is altruism is the name of the game. Uh, you know, uh, we had uh, one of the earlier presentations was talking about, you know, what would you get out of it? Um, we had all sorts of benefits like learning and the community and uh, uh, a gaining experience. Um, and it's true. You can get experience. It looks great on your resume afterwards. Um, in today's day and age, uh, HR personnel recruiters are increasingly looking at your social profile when you're applying for a job. So the fact that you're doing uh, open source contribution is going to be a big thing and it will get noticed. So who is this for? And before I get into who this is for, uh, I want to take a second to talk about the Parade of Pink Spot. Now in 1896, uh, a guy named Joseph M. Duran suggested uh, the Pareto Principle. He, uh, he named it after uh, the Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto. And the Pareto Principle talks about the vital few and the useful many. Okay, And, and it says that basically for many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from only 20% of the causes. So how does that have to do with open source at all? It's certainly lightweight open source. So in open source, we have our heavyweights. Right? We have people like Linus Torvalds, uh, who developed Linux. We have, uh, from Docker family, we have Jerome Petazoni. I have to hear from the ASF, we have guys like uh, Jim Jagielski, uh, Kelsey Hightower, and the work he's been doing with Google and Kubernetes. Right? These guys are heavyweights. They contribute uh, massive amounts of their time, uh, of their working day and working hours, uh, and even of their non-working hours and efforts. And then we have the other 20%, right? The lightweights, right, in, 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 in correspondence to those heavy lifters. Now, the lightweights are actually 80% of the community, uh, and they're getting 80, only 20% of the amount of work uh, done. But these guys are critical, because when we talk about the heavyweights, we're talking about domain experts. But there's something that domain experts are really missing out, and that is the subdomain expertise. So what am I talking about when I talk about subdomain expertise? Let me give you an example. I don't know if he's here in the audience now, but uh, does anyone know who this is? This is Lewis McGibney. Lewis McGibney uh, is a member of the ASF. And I first met him actually in, I think it was 2011. Uh, he and I met at Heathrow Airport. We were both on our way to uh, Apache in North America, which was in Vancouver back then. You know, it wasn't COVID. We actually got to go uh, and meet each other. Uh, and we just got the chat and we met at the airport in We had a whole flight, uh, you know, the, the way over. Um, and I asked him about himself, and he really fascinated me. And, you know, I'm not just sharing him because it's Apache uh, I'm sharing him uh, because of his story. And he told me that he actually, when I asked him how he got involved uh, with, with the ASF, he said, his background isn't even in software engineering. His background was in civil engineering, and later with a PhD in engineering informatics. He worked with construction, and in his work with construction projects, 
he realized that a big part of any work in any uh, construction project is the communication between a big variety of stakeholders. And part of the problem that arise when these projects would get really compressed and there'd be huge amounts of people is the ability to find the correct information at a particular time. And that got him to look into information at retrieval uh, and information eventually in the act of developing software to address uh, issues around that. And that got him to Apache. He discovered the Apache Lucene project uh, and searching. He started looking at source code and writing problems and building software capable of helping him uh, solve some of the obstacles that he was experiencing within his PhD work. And when he started, you know, he, he dealt a bit with uh, Lucene, he dealt with Nutch. A few years later, when I checked back into it, uh, he was involved in all sorts of projects here, just in the ASF, with Tika, with the incubator, with uh, NE23, with the climate work bunch. Okay? Now, why am I saying this? Because a lot of people who come into open source, they feel that they there's a certain bar that's going to be expected of them on the on the software engineering level, and that's just not true. You know, this is an example of a very successful person in the open source community uh, who started with zero knowledge with software engineering. So it, it, it's just not that, and his contributions are actually encoded. And in a bit, we're going to talk about other kinds of contributions that are not only code. So really, if you've been hesitant, if you've been saying, well, I'm not good enough, or I don't have the background that I need, or I, uh, no, it's excuses. If you want to get involved, then the community is looking for you, uh, and we're welcoming with open arms. Okay, so that deals with the why. Now we want to talk about, about the how. How can you help? How can you get involved? Well. There are a number of ways that you can get involved. Um, first and foremost is uh, bugs, right? And if you go, they will come. Uh -huh. Every software project, uh, open source and commercial alike, uh, is usually ridden with uh, nasty software bugs. Uh, and the community, the subdomain expertise that you can get uh, out of submitting bugs uh, is enormously valuable because People who are developing the software are developing the software from a very particular mindset. They're in a box, even if they're building unit tests and integration tests and all sorts of you know great testing framework, which is a really important thing. It's very different than running in end user environments and understanding the kind of bugs that can come up with all sorts of edge use cases um, that these people aren't uh, even considering. Um, and the truth is, it's really easy to get involved and to do that kind of thing today. Uh, uh, GitHub being what it is, uh, there's an enormous amount of focus on GitHub. And thank you, Microsoft, uh, for, for, your, um, for your contribution and for, for taking ownership and, and continue the stewardship of GitHub. You know, who thought that I would have said that 15 years ago? Um, it's an amazing platform. Uh, and it makes it really, it really lowers the bar uh, to get the bug. And there are going to be different software projects out of them. Some will have templates which they want you to fill out. Some will, will even really be insistent that you fill it out their way because they might need that kind of information. But nothing gets, nothing actually doesn't get looked at, or almost nothing in most projects, right? Uh, if you can give the details, you don't know how much details are going to need. Usually, uh, in, 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 if there's a template for an issue report, then the developers are going to kind of guide you to this is the kind of information or this is the type of logs uh, that we're going to need. But it might not always be there. If it's not there, be as detailed as you can. Uh, and another really important takeaway when you're dealing with bug reports is to follow up to confirm the fixes. You know, sometimes uh, sometimes you'll report about you know this few feature just not working and when you're when you're doing it in in, in AWS. It works in, in, in Google Cloud, but when you run it in AWS, it doesn't work. And, and they say, well, try it, and it might fix it for you. So if so, follow up, confirm that the fix actually worked. Um, but again, even if you don't, you've already been involved this all. Now, one of the things that I really love uh, about this Apache Con, uh, in contrast to every previous uh, Apache Con that we've had, uh, is the uh, insane international um, presence at this. So. People who English is your native tongue, 
a great place to help out is localization. And it's not always, you know, English isn't your uh, your your um, primary your primary language. Uh, here at the Apache Software Foundation, English has become a first class citizen. But that's not true with all the projects out there. Uh, if you know the language that a project has been developed in or documented in or um, displayed, the user interface is displayed in, and you know another language, then your help would be uh, phenomenal. Help translate the project, the documentation, whatever it is, uh, to your language, because that's a place where you have subdomain expertise that the, the creators of that open source software uh, may not have. So, um, and it's a critical thing. Okay, I could just see that uh, Sharon said that the sound is a little muffled. Uh, can you hear a little bit better? Yeah, yeah, this is good. Okay, I'm really, really sorry. So localization uh, help translate the project into your language. Answering questions is a huge thing. So here at Apache. Uh, we have the idea of users mailing lists. Every single top level project will, uh, I think every single top level project will have a user's mailing list. These aren't even necessarily developer or, or development related questions. These are end user questions. Um, but it doesn't have to be on the mailing list. I and mean, we have users lists. Uh, people still use IRC or Discord or Slack or whatever. Uh, GitHub, a lot of times people open bug reports uh, on things that are not necessarily even bug reports. And, you know, that's okay. That, that happens. Uh, but the developers who are monitoring the, the issue trackers may not be able to, to answer it. But here you could bring in subdomain uh, expertise. Um, and, of course, you know, Stack Overflow, uh, the, the, uh, one of the most popular repositories of just, you know, general technical knowledge out there today. Um, it's, you know, don't, don't be satisfied with just reading answers or copying and pasting code from there. Get involved, help out. I guarantee you, every single one of you out there, that you know something about your favorite project that a lot of other users don't. Um, and that knowledge can really, be, really uh, be critical. Uh, patches, patches are welcome. Um, I actually, I have a story that I want to tell uh, about this slide. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was working uh, at a different company, a company called Iron Source, uh, and one of we were, we were playing around with Rancher and uh, Kubernetes. This would have been uh, four years ago. Kubernetes wasn't quite where it was today. And uh, one of our DevOps engineers found you know, some sort of a little issue, um, and he couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. And he ended up delving into the source code. Uh, and finding, you know, why Kubernetes wasn't working quite the way that he needed uh, Kubernetes to work, and he fixed it. And uh, his name was Dean. I went over to him, and he was telling me, yeah, and I got uh, I have a problem and got it fixed. And I said, Dima, dude, uh, you know, go to GitHub, open a pull request. Um, and, and the feedback that I got was, um, you know, no, I don't think so. Uh, it might, it might not, you know, who else actually cares about this really long shot use case, uh, which is the use case that he was dealing with. Um, and, and I pushed him and he, he went and eventually after a bit of prodding, he went and he opened the, uh, he opened the pull request. And guess what happened? Nothing. Radio silence. And, um, Silence. A week, two weeks, a month, two months went by, and he comes back and he's like, "Yeah, you know, Isaac, you gave me advice. You said, you know, build the patch, but I, I told you, it's, just, it, it's not important enough to them. They don't care about this particular use case. You know, I'm, I'm kind of sorry I even uh, I even bothered. Now I'm now I'm really embarrassed." Two days later, he uh, he gets a reply on GitHub. You know, sorry, you know, we really appreciate the, uh, the, the, the patch. The truth is that you uh, you actually contributed the patch just a few days after we went into a feature and bug freeze because of a big upcoming release. Uh, but we got it out of the way, and uh, we're, we're merging it in uh, to Trump. And, and, and it's in today. 
Um, and he needless to say, you know, he came back to me, he was beating me like Isaac, Isaac. But look, they took it, they took the patch. Um, and, and, and that came with its own thing, you know, a, a part of just the, 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 the feeling good uh, of it. And a part of the reward for getting, you know, the, the contributor or icon or title or whatever it is that, that, that GitHub puts uh, once your code, you know, patched with your Git handle uh, is merged into a patch. So aside from that, it means that a domain expert, you know, one of the, the, the people who do Kubernetes for either, either for a living or as their full-time side project, actually went in, vetted your case, decided that there was demonstrated subdomain expertise uh, and went in and did it. Um, and, you know, that's not a one example. Uh, I had uh, another colleague of mine run into a similar uh, kind of an edge case thing uh, with a rabbit MQ software, also around the same amount of time the patch was accepted. Uh, I myself I put in, not even a patch, a bug report uh, for HashiCorp uh, Terraform product uh, for those who are you know into Terraform. So the the, the, the next uh, major money in their terms uh, released was just released about a month ago, uh, and when it was open in open beta, I you know gave them this report very detailed saying you know I tried doing this and it didn't quite work, and there's a lot of back and forth with uh, one of the, the, the entry level people there who's trying to debug it, and it went idle. And actually, just this morning I woke up with one of the engineers saying, "Hey, I'm sorry, it took too long, Isaac." I created a test case here at this, my own personal repository, but I can't quite recreate it. Can you give it a try? Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 there's no really happy ending to the story about me because in the end, what happened was I went, I couldn't re, uh, recreate it. And then I took an hour of my day and I went back, you know, in time uh, to get to the original issue that, I, that it was that I thought I triggered it or something, you know, approximating the original issue because obviously if there was a bug in it, I didn't actually uh, commit that to source code. Um, and I actually got back to him and said, you know what? I can't recreate it with my original code with the original versions of the software. So it's not always there either. Uh, but that was also really appreciated because suddenly, you know, there, there was this, this engineer came out with a bit of uh, um, closure to, to his side of things because remember, um, you know, kind of on the same vein of what Prashant was uh, uh, presenting in the previous uh, um, in the previous presentation. Here, we're all human. We're all human beings. You know, and, and in open source, especially, uh, where community is such a central thing, we're all open. You know, we're all human beings. And just taking the time to write, hey, you know, I gave it a shot. I couldn't reproduce it. Um, that goes a long way, also. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is micro projects. Does, does, does anyone, uh, is there anyone uh, from the Node.js community in the audience that, that recognizes this? I, I don't think so. Uh, I guess a lot of people uh, got scared off by the fact that we didn't have a presentation we were supposed to start. Um, this is the source code of a uh, very famous library on NPM uh, called Left Code, uh, Left Code, Left Panel. This is the entire source code of it. Now, there's a very interesting story behind it. And you might think, you know, this is silly. And what does this do for anyone who reads JavaScript? You can see that all this does, this entire module, which is insanely popular, all it does is it takes a string and it removes any leading white space from the left side of that string and it gives a back. Simple, right? So what happened? Uh, this was written by a guy named uh, Ezer Kusulu, uh, and about five or six years ago, no, four or five years ago, uh, he had a, he had a whole bunch of things that were all published to npm. npm is the is the uh, module registry for Node.js. Okay, that's where you know uh, it's the equivalent of CPAN if you're on Perl, or Pipey if you're on Python, or NuGet if you're on um, uh, uh, C sharp or C++ and etc. You get the idea. So uh, this guy Azor actually had a lot of libraries published, and this was like a really really small one. And without going into too many details, there was a conflict with the name of another package that he'd uh, written. You know, he had another package. I don't remember it offhand. I'm sorry. Uh, called Foo, and there was this company that said that said, hey, you know. 
uh, we actually develop a commercial product called Foo, and we'd like to use that namespace. Would you mind giving it to us? And he basically answered back saying, yeah, um, no, because uh, there are a lot of people using this uh, this namespace that, of the package that I developed, and I don't want to ruin their lives. Um, so being a classic example of an of a anti-pattern in open source, this company said, okay, well, they went to NPM, the company uh, who managed the corporate entity that managed the, 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 the project registry, and they said, slap trademark infringement. This project is using our name. We, we have a trademark registered for the name. We want that. Now, open source is tends to be backed by corporate that brings a lot of money into it, either a corporate entity sponsoring a project or a whole bunch of corporate entities just sponsoring general funds, uh, kind of like the way things work here at the ASF. So when a big company comes with a big lit litigation suit, there's not always a lot of options that, that could be taken. It depends on the strength of the, of the, of the company. So the NPM registry basically caved. Uh, and they said, sorry, is there, we, uh, we've got a legal complaint. We're legally obliged to this. And they went and they, uh, they, they, own, they moved the ownership of that namespace uh, from Azer to, to this company. And Azer wrote an open letter he discovered a few hours later. He wrote a really angry open letter. Uh, and he went and unpublished his everything that he had on NPM, and he said, you know, forget it. I don't want anything, you know, if you're going to play the corporate game, and I don't want anything to do with you. And he unpublished this little left pad, um, this little left pad module. And you might think, interesting story, you know, classic uh, evil corp kind of, uh, kind of tones. So what? So, so what happened over the next few hours? Over the next few hours, builds on a huge, huge amount. I'm talking like 70, 80 percent of commercial projects uh, built with Node.js out there started dying, and no one could figure out what was going on. It took several hours uh, of of digging, but it turned out that a very famous transpiler for Node.js uh, called Babel. Uh, actually had this left pad as a dependency. Now, not everyone was using left pad immediately, you know, as a first, as a direct dependency. But you had, uh, Babel was a huge, hugely, hugely popular framework because it allowed, it allowed you uh, basically to use new JavaScript features that were not yet released into the language by kind of forward, backwards compiling it uh, into the existing JavaScript uh, framework. So you could use all these new cool features and keywords and whatnot. And Babel had a dependency on LeftPad. And when LeftPad disappeared, Babel disappeared. And when Babel disappeared, build scripts for enormous amounts of code that were using uh, Babel just stopped working. Um, and in the end, uh, someone uh, someone managed to find an old copy. Uh, LeftPad had been very permissively licensed, so someone just you know back found the original code, uh, put up a new uh, project on npm. I believe they even got the namespace back. They went and they complained to npm. Npm guys, I, I, we appreciate what you're trying to do to this corporation, but you just broke the caused the internet to get broken. Um, NPM got a, a little bit ruffled in this case. Azer actually uh, willingly gave up uh, his claims on the on the left pad namespace because he still wanted nothing to do with NPM anymore. Uh, and so the, the the person who overtook the project had this actually uh, available and was able to to republish left pad uh, with the original source code under you know a similarly permissive uh, uh, library. And life went back to normal. It was the buzz of the internet. Uh, anyone in the Node.js community knew about this for all of three or four days. So nice story, what's the point? Point is don't be afraid of micro projects, okay? This is a really, really simple uh, project, as you can see. This is the entirety of an open source project. Uh, an open source project that the author, any casual viewer, and think, hey, you know, this, this isn't critical, man. <laughs> there, there are a million ways that this could be done. Who, who cares about this? Um, and this is the perfect example to show you how much impact that could have. You know, the subdomain expertise that someone had, not because they were the only ones that knew how to write it, because they were the first ones that bothered to write it and bothered to publish it and share it with the community. Um, and, and it became, and it still is, 
such a major player uh, in, in a hugely popular ecosystem uh, over the course of years and years. Um, so don't be afraid. So caveats, um, don't overcommit. Don't burn out, slow and steady wins the race. You know, wins it. it's, it's not a race, it's a marathon. Um, don't come with expectations. You know, if you come to the game thinking, I'm gonna write the next left pad, you know, or I'm gonna write the next Kubernetes, or I'm gonna write the next whatever, or, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, I spent 50 hours trying to reverse engineer this, this really tight edge case, which was incredibly complicated, but I did it, I got the solution, and I wanna share it with everyone. And it may not get looked at, right? Like my friend Dean earlier, it, it, he had two months, no one, no one, radio silence. Um, he had a happy ending. Not everyone has the happy ending. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the bug will just sit. Sometimes uh, it'll get overlooked. Sometimes the community just won't click with it. Um, so yeah, don't come with expectations. Um, have a passion for what you do, okay? Uh, I wrote an interesting post on this um, uh, prompted by Stephen Wally, who's a, a big open source uh, advocate, uh, and he works. He's actually been working 20 years in Microsoft, so even the old Microsoft, um, you know, he was a big uh, open source person. He he helped write the original uh, Unix uh, subsystem, which has been uh, replaced by the modern uh, WSL subsystem, which has become amazingly popular uh, in Windows 10. And um, he and I had a discussion at one point uh, around the time when, when I gave this talk, uh, when I last gave this talk uh, at, at the at an OSI party uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, and we were talking about why people would want to give. And I it was very, um, my personal opinionated view is that uh, I think a lot of the people here in open source are, who are successful at doing it continually. Uh, over years and years and years and still not burning out. It's people who are giving for the sake of giving. It's giving because uh, it's it, because it's spreading love, because love, you know, we were talking about emotions in the last uh, lecture, is an incredibly powerful and important human emotion. Uh, and this sometimes sometimes is the way that we, or one of the ways that we can express it uh, and share, you know, with, with the entire world. Um, if you don't really connect to, to what I just said, uh, and if you don't really have the passion, if you're not able to give for the sake of giving, or if you don't feel, you know, warm and gooey and, and, and uh, empowered uh, by by the fact that you're giving, then you're in the danger of above pitfalls. That doesn't mean don't give. Give anyways. Uh, everything is appreciated, like I've uh, been saying for the last half an hour or so. But be careful. Don't overcommit. Slow and steady. So marathon, not a race. And don't come with the expectations. And uh, most importantly, have fun, because that's really what it's about. Um, finished a, bit, a little bit early. Uh, I'll try to go fast, because we have the little gremlins back. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So do I think that sometimes when people start contributing to open source, they want to show that they're good uh, and so want to do a lot of things fast? Uh, it depends on the person, but absolutely. Like I said, one of the big motives for open source, you know, is, uh, is, is not only getting the experience, but getting the visibility, you know, in social channels because it could help you. People might see your posts. Uh, people might see stars on uh, GitHub, and, and that might help you get your next job or get involved in something else that you care about. Um, so you, you, they might be doing lots of things fast. Now, the question that you didn't ask, uh, which I'd like to follow up on, is, is that a problem? And it really depends on the person. So if you're doing it, uh, you know, from a place of altruism, if you're enjoying what you're doing, even though you're going fast, then it doesn't matter. Then, you know, keep, keep the pace up, keep going fast. Uh, if you feel that, that, that you're starting to burn out, if you're starting to feel like this isn't so much fun anymore, um, then definitely put the brakes on a little bit, you know, tone it back. Maybe even take a break. Take a break for a week, take a break for a month, take a break for a year. 
uh, but come back because the community needs you. An open source world needs you. Anything else? At the beginning of the talk, you saw a slide about open climate workbench. Uh, I think you're, you're referring to uh, this slide, right? This slide, uh, if so, actually isn't so much about uh, Apache Open Climate Workbench, which I unfortunately don't know so much about, uh, as much as it's about uh, my friend Lewis, um, and kind of, you know, explaining how even without thinking that you have the background, uh, you not only contribute, but you could become a major contributor if you'd only give yourself a chance to do so. Uh, so I'm sorry, I can't really talk more about Open Climate Workbench. Uh, but with this, these three days of tracks here at ApacheCon, hopefully you'll be able to find a session um, that will give you more of the information that you need. Uh, thank you, and I'm sorry. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to take that as a no. Thank you so much uh, for bearing with me. Uh, and I hope this talk left you a little bit more inspired uh, to come be a part, be a part of open source, be a part of Apache Software Foundation, be a part of whatever you desire to be. Uh, but know that there are people out there that are going to appreciate it, and you will be making an impact in a better world, whether you know it or not. Thank you so, so much, uh, and enjoy the rest of ApacheCon. Bye.